This is 15 Minutes of Freedom. I'm your host, Elite Life Optimization Coach Ryan Nidell, and today is day one of Wellness Week here on 15 Minutes of Freedom. Over the next seven days, I'm going to share with you practical and tactical tips as it pertains to your health and wellness inside the body quadrant of your life. So here we are, day number one. I don't know that I've ever covered an in-depth basis practical things that don't cost you money or don't cost you much money as it pertains to your health and wellness. Right, I've covered the true dark glasses that I wear, I've covered the juve red light that's in front of me, photobiomodulation, all this all this crazy stuff. Might have even covered some cold showers before. But that's that's all more towards the biohacking side in my opinion. Now, with a heightened sense of awareness, it is my belief system that biohacking is actually just a way to return back to how we used to operate as humans. Generations and generations and generations ago, evolutionarily speaking, when we were walking around outside in nature, when the sun went down, we huddled up around a campfire. We found warmth with the people that we were around. We eventually fell asleep. More than likely, when the sun rose, we woke up. Showers weren't really a thing. If we were to clean ourselves off, it was probably because we found a stream, maybe a lake, maybe a waterfall. And oddly enough, that water wasn't very warm, more than likely. Probably rather cold. So you think about the blue light adaptation, right? I'm sitting in an office right now with overhead lights. There was no blue light back in the prehistoric times, right? Cavemen time. The red light that would be initiated once the sun went down was natural light based off a fire being created. Yes, and I know before you start picking on me through email or direct messages, fire came about at some point in our evolutionary journey. I'm not implying that every caveman had fire, right? Just just work with me in the generalities here. But as I look at all that we do to dim out blue light and to increase red light, And to reset our circadian rhythm, right? That's the rhythm in which our bodies know when to sleep and when to wake up. It's no wonder in modern day society that we are seeing a plethora of health issues that weren't previously there. Now, the counterpart to that, the counterpoint to that is, of course, that people are living longer, right? How is that possible? Our our health and our longevity is greater now than it's ever been before. In the past, I believe it's 15 years, it might even be 20 I'll even say it's 50. Our life expectancy has increased by more than 30 years in Eastern civilization. I'm sorry, Western civilization. That's impactful, right? So we can look at big pharma. We can look at all the things we have access to and all the resources. Sure, we're living longer. But is the quality and and caliber of life that we're living, is it greater now than it used to be? I'll leave that up for you to decide. What I want to get into today is some some very basic things that will help you start to create a framework to have a body that feels and operates better. Now, I cover all of this stuff in a much more in-depth manner in the book that I have been writing that has taken different iterations that will be called the Life Optimization Guide that I have committed to have completed by the end of July where I go through a whole plethora of things, right? It's going to be, I'll call it like a field manual for how to live the most optimized life from all the knowledge that I have at this point, citing resources and references, case studies, testimonials, everything I can find. But the first thing I want to talk about is dieting, right? What you put in your body, the fuel that goes in your mouth. I mean, think about that right now. As you've listened to this, more than likely at this moment, You have either just eaten, you can remember the last meal, or you're currently looking forward to your next meal. Have you ever thought about that for a second? Western civilization, the majority of our day is calibrated around a calendar and a schedule that is only concerned with where our next meal is coming from. I say this as I am now the better part of 24 hours into another fasting protocol. Going through a fast is a lot more than just a body recalibration. To me, it's a recalibration mentally about the control that food has over me or now doesn't have over me. I mean, think about all the ways that we show up in the world as far as it pertains to diet and how difficult it is when you pass by a McDonald's with your window down in the summer not to smell that 
quote unquote cheeseburger that brings you back to your youth. I used to love going to McDonald's and getting the double cheeseburgers, the fries, the Coke. Sprite was my thing, not Coke so much. Maybe some nuggets, some sweet and sour sauce. And if I was super good and lucky, when I was a kid, you could get that little tiny ice cream cone that they gave to you almost for free. I loved it. But when the window's down in the summer and you can smell that smell, it's so difficult not to pull in. There's a good chance you yourself have pulled into one of those spots. If not today or yesterday, certainly in the past month. Just statistically speaking, there's a reason why McDonald's has served billions of people across the planet. Whatever they put in their quote-unquote burger, whatever smells they pump into the air, trigger a response inside of us, don't they? Maybe it's not fast food, right? Maybe that's not your thing. I get it, it's not mine. It's been the better part of 17 months now since I've had a fast food meal. My choice, not an ivory tower thing, just once I started doing the research on what actually goes into what we call to be food from those restaurants, I decided that stuff wasn't for me. Chipotle is about as far out the window as I go. And even they've had their own health issues here in Columbus. Inappropriate ways to cook food and all types of things. But you think about when you go to a restaurant, how difficult is it for you not to order an appetizer? When you don't feel like cooking and you go to that restaurant, how difficult is it for you to eat the healthy things on the menu? To push away the french fries and get a salad or broccoli? To stay away from dessert? To not grab the alcohol because why wouldn't you? It's social. You see, in Western civilization, we've now treated food Like it's a social experiment. It's a social thing. You want to have a business meeting, where do you go? Out for coffee, let's grab lunch together, or let's talk about it over drinks and dinner. Are you kidding me? Like what if just for a second you considered food to be fuel? And it was no different than going to the gas station. Right? You don't care how the gas smells that goes in your car. You care about how it makes your car perform. You're not saying to your business partner or potential client, let's meet at the gas pump and discuss some business. Why? Because it's just fuel. It becomes almost automatic, right? You take the handle out, you put it in the hole in the side of your car. You pick what sort of octane you want. And then you put it in. There's even debates around that, right? In every car that I've owned for the past three years, both luxury and non-luxury, right now I drive a pickup truck, an American-made pickup truck. Every time I go to the gas pump, I am forced to make a decision between three qualities of gas, three different octanes. Typically, it's a hybrid of either 87 or 89 and then 91 and 93, right? Some sort of variation of those four. There was a version of me that died a long time ago that always went for the cheapest, Right? Do, you, do you feel the same way? Like, I'm, I'm just going to put the cheapest stuff in the car. Why wouldn't I? I need to save the 20 cents a gallon. I understand. But what happens when you start changing that and you put the belief system in that the quality of food or fuel you put in your car will determine the longevity of that car, just like it does your body? And the average tank, right? I drive a truck. I have an 18-gallon tank when it's almost all the way empty. Extra 20 cents a gallon. Right, again, I'm not a mathematician, but let's just call it another four bucks per fill-up. Let's say I fill up once a week. Over the course of a year, that's an extra 280 bucks. For putting the top-end gas in my car versus the entry level. So that becomes a value proposition, a value question that I instill upon myself. Like, is it really worth 280 bucks? To, have my, to give my truck or my car the greatest opportunity for success? Yes. 100%. With no question. Because that same mindset on such a monotonous thing, right? Think of how many times you filled up your gas tank in the past month. More than likely, at least twice. But that monotonous decision, that seemingly simple 
press one of the buttons on the gas pump decision, when you start instantly pressing the most expensive one, what do you think starts to happen to your brain when you go to the grocery store and you're faced with options about what you put in your body? Do you think you go for the least expensive or do you think you go for the stuff that's the highest quality? And what about when you go out to eat? You think you put the garbage in, the fried food, the nonsense, or do you think you start putting in the stuff that know, you know is going to give you energy? It's my belief system you're probably going to pick the thing that gives you energy, which is what I'm going to talk about today. You see, as we look at diets, a majority of us want to do one of two things. Lose weight or gain muscle. Right? I mean, that's, that's really as simple as this comes down to. If you're a little overweight, you say, man, I would like to tone up. And if you're on the slender side, you're like, man, I'd like to get stronger. I'd like to get bigger. I'm going to let you in on an incredible secret. Forget every diet you've ever heard of for a second. Forget paleo. Forget keto. Forget caveman. Forget whatever the different fad things are. Right? There are so many fads. I, I don't, and fad is, is not even a, a, a proper term. There's these diet ideologies that come in waves. Right, like I'm a keto athlete, seems to be a big thing right now, right? High fat, high protein, no carbs. Beautiful. Let's talk about that for a second. There is something that you have inside of you right now called your resting metabolic rate. If you do not know what that is, I encourage you to write it down and Google it. Don't take my word for any of this stuff. Side note, I'm not a licensed dietitian or nutritionist. I just happen to have done a freakish amount of research on how all this works and been my own guinea pig for the past 14 years. So your resting metabolic rate is the number of calories, give or take, plus or minus, that are required for you to function exactly as you sit under normal circumstances. Normal circumstances don't include working out. They don't include high stress. They don't include low sleep. They include for you just to basically exist under a mildly sedentary load, you have a resting metabolic rate that is what is required for you to live. It's different for men and women. It's different based off ages. It's different based off of internal bodily functions. It's different based off visceral fat. There are different resting metabolic rates for all of us. I share that with you because there's a high probability that when you quote unquote jump into ketosis, we're eating high protein and high fat. All you are simply doing is putting yourself in a caloretic deficit, meaning your resting metabolic rate, what it's required to have you sustain life, you are eating less calories per day than that number. You do that for a long enough period of time, your body says, oh man, what am I going to do? I'm burning through more, more gas that's in the tank right now. I'm going to turn to the reserves. I'm going to turn to my liver and process the glycogen or store carbohydrates that are there for energy. And once that gets expelled, I'm going to go ahead and turn to my muscles and I'm going to pull some glycogen out of there. And then also, depending on the load, I might turn to some muscle as well. I got to do something. I got to keep this thing alive. And so you start to lose weight. But over time, our bodies do this crazy thing. They always seek homeostasis. Homeostasis being something that is consistent for your body in which it just quote unquote levels out. It's my personal belief system that homeostasis can be found in most of us in about a 70 to maybe 96 hour load. Meaning if you eat the same thing at the same time of day, under the same stress, the same sleep, the same variables, what you are doing will not be as effective or efficient at either burning fat or building muscle after a 96 hour window. So you got to change some stuff up. We'll cover that in a future episode. We're going to stay high level for right now. So you take keto, you're eating less calories than you need to, to sustain life. Over a period of time, you lose weight. Typically, people start telling you, like, man, you look great. What are you doing differently? Oh, man, I'm keto right now. I get to eat cheese and red meat and all the great stuff, right? MCT oils on everything. I'm a machine right now. I've never felt so clear. Fantastic. But then eventually the gains stop. 
right? And the gains can be losing weight can be considered a gain, right? You're, you're not efficiently burning fat any longer because your body's used to this now. And so what happens? Well, your thyroid function changes. Thyroid's what puts out, pumps out hormones into your body to help regulate your metabolic rate. It's a conversion from T3 to T4, or maybe it's vice versa. Again, I'm not scientifically based on all this. It's my own research. And so what happens is now your metabolic rate slows down to reach your new caloretic load. Not only have you lost weight, so the calories required have decreased, but your body is also like, man, I'm just not getting enough fuel. I better ratchet all this down. And so your fat loss starts to decrease. So what do most of us do? We take away more calories. If it worked to start with, I'm just going to start cutting back on calories. I'll get this puppy started again. What happens? Have you been there before yourself? Nothing. If anything, you actually start to put on weight and you get frustrated and confused. Why is this happening to me? I'm doing everything right. It worked before. It's not working now. What gives? What gives is the fact of your body is convinced that it's not going to get enough food in the, f- food in the future for fuel. So it takes what you eat and it stores it. Caveman style once again. What happens in old times, right? We'll go back to this imaginary caveman situation. As you were walking around with your tribe or maybe you're hunting saber-toothed tigers or woolly mammoths or whatever you were eating back then. I don't care if it was nuts and fruit. At some point, the food storages around you are no longer there. You've depleted the resources. So maybe it's a day or two or a week, but you're going to have to go ahead and beat feet. You're going to have to go out and walk and find somewhere new to pillage for new food. Our bodies are set up to be adaptable to that type of environment. It's in our genealogy. It's how we're wired. So when you're starving yourself on calories, your body's used to this. Thousands of years, it's built into it. So it stores everything. It's just getting prepared. So let's talk about what I would do differently, or at least encourage you to consider. Instead of winging it on a diet, what if you got scientific? What if you used data and facts to help you make an educated decision? That is what I encourage every client to do on some of our first phone calls. The body is, to me, one of the most important quadrants of this whole game that we play called life. Because if you don't treat it right, your life decreases. The total time. If you don't treat it right, the quality of life decreases. If you don't treat it right, your energy levels decrease. And nothing else can be done as efficiently. First thing I encourage every client to do is find something called a DEXA scan. D-E-X-A-C-A-N. And a DEXA scan, or a water submersion tank, either or, not both, are currently some of the most sophisticated body fat measuring systems known to man. The water displacement being number one, right? It is as scientific as possible. DEXA scan being number two. Then from there, there's all these new devices, right? There's, you might've seen an in-body scan where you stand on the scale looking thing and you hold two handles out and pass an electric current through your body and it tells you how much fat you have. You might've seen the little handheld device that some gyms have, right? That's a small version with two little handles with a readout on it. You might have even seen in some gyms the little fat calipers that pinch your fat on seven specific parts of your body. They do a formulaic expression. They say, you have this much body fat. Those are in descending order, in my opinion, of efficiency. So you find yourself a DEXA scan, and you pay the 100 to 150 bucks. You're going to have to invest in yourself. I don't have stock in DEXA scan. I don't have an agreement with them. I'd love to have one of the guys on the show. Whoever created that, I would love to have you on here and chat with you. If you happen to know somebody in that field, have them reach out to me. I'm fascinated how they came up with this technology. But you lay down on the table, they scan your body, and they give you this printout. Printout tells you a bunch of stuff. Body fat, estimated visceral fat, balance between the left and right side of your body, the top and the bottom, and the most important factor, your resting metabolic rate. 
But even that alone, in my opinion, is still not quite yet enough to make the most educated decision about how to calibrate a diet for you. There's one more variable. I would then encourage you, typically in the same testing facility, to get a VO2 max reading done as well. That's basically the amount of oxygen your blood can carry at any given moment. That's going to determine the efficiency of blood flow, the can, efficiency of your body's ability to process oxygen and CO2, right, which you exhale out. And it's also going to give you its own metabolic rate processing. When you combine those two together and take an average, now you've almost got it dialed in to something that can be specific. Crazy, right? Science, data, facts. No fiction here. Only facts. And so you take these numbers and you get something, right? You get some variable. Let's say you have a resting metabolic rate of 2,500 calories a day. Pretty simple number. From there, let's say you exercise. And you exercise mildly hard and you're in there for about an hour. More than likely, I don't give a shit what the treadmill says. I don't care what your heart rate monitor says. I don't care about any of that. For the average person, you're somewhere between two and 400 calories. Let's just average it and say it's 300 additional calories. I can then say at that moment in time, your metabolic rate, what's required for that day is 2,800 calories. I'm gonna make this super simple. If you want to lose body fat, decrease the amount of calories you eat per day by about 200. Yep, two to 300 calories consistently for a couple days you're going to start to see a change. If you want to increase muscle mass, not only do you have to work out hard, not only do you have to tear down muscle, then you need to fuel it with a little bit of a surplus, a little bit of an excess, and maybe 150 extra calories a day. Now, it's my personal belief system that if you look at total caloretic load, you should be 20% of your calories, maybe 25%, more heavily weighted towards protein. So I'm going to share with you some more numbers real quick. If you don't have a pen out, you might want to grab one. Every gram of protein has four calories, meaning every gram of protein that you eat takes four calories of expenditure of your body to burn it, to use it as fuel. Carbohydrates also have four calories associated with them. Fat, on the other hand, has nine calories associated with it. Four, four, and nine. So let's say out of the 2,500 calories you need, let's say you want to lose weight. You're burning 2,800 calories. You're going to eat 2,500. Make it super simple. Let's say 20% of that you want to be protein. It's 500 calories. Divided by four, because every gram of protein has four calories. It's 125 grams of protein a day. It's just that simple to start with. How do you get 125 grams of protein, you might ask? You're going to have to look at the back of food containers. You're going to have to figure it out. You're going to have to do a little bit of mathematics. You're going to want to spread it out over meals that are allowing you three to four hours of digestion, bare minimum between meals. We can get into intermittent fasting and eating for your blood type. Those are going to be tomorrow. This is just simple, basic groundwork. So for me, the average person, you know, you're probably able to consume 30 to 45 grams of protein per meal. Pretty simple. About a six ounce chicken breast or six eggs or six ounces of ground beef, right? It's kind of in that six to eight ounce range. Very obtainable for most of us. From there, depending on what your glycemic load is, your ability to process carbohydrates, how out of whack your insulin sensitivity is, would in my opinion determine how many carbs versus fats you have. See, carbs are somewhat necessary. They are not completely necessary. But for most of us, to go straight keto would have some long-term ramifications. My personal opinion would be, okay, if 20% of your calories have come from protein, let's look at 50% from fat and look, let's look at 30% from carbs. So 2,500 calories, 1,225 calories from fat, divide that by 9 because every gram of fat has 9 calories associated with it. And I don't have my calculator pulled up, but very, very roughly, what is that? 160 grams of fat. That sounds like way too many. 
I'm literally going to now pull up my calculator because if I tell you something wrong and then you email me in and say that I'm, I messed you up, I'm going to feel badly about it. 136 grams of fat, right? Which might sound like a lot, but if you eat some red meat, if you eat some fish, some omega-3s, some omega-6s, even if you use natural grass-fed butter, that is really, really easy to get to let alone something like brain octane or XCT oil from Bulletproof, right? There's all these other variables. 136 grams of fat is very, very simple. And fat inherently, contrary to what we were told in the 80s, is not bad for you. It's just not. Just break it up over equal meals. Stay away from the really processed fat. Then, of course, the rest of your calories can come from carbohydrates. My opinion on carbohydrates, if you can't pick it from the ground, you should probably stay away from it. It would be called root vegetables. Sweet potatoes, yams, maybe some actual potatoes. I would personally stay away from breads and grains and things that had to be milled or processed. I just think they're harder on your body. That is my opinion. That is not scientifically proven or proof. That will come tomorrow and what we'll talk about there. Now, all of a sudden, you've created a caloretic deficit. That caloretic deficit should be carried on over seven days, maybe 14, altering the time of day you eat by a little bit, altering the cadence of meals you eat, always keeping in the back of your mind, man, every 72 hours, my body's probably catching up. That's three days in a row. On the fourth day, if I have red meat for the third meal, let me have it for the second meal. Let me switch those two up. Let me see what else happens. Side note, you should be drinking at least one ounce of water per pound of body weight. Way to stay hydrated. In addition to the water, water is a flushing mechanism. You need to add some things to make the water stick where it needs to stick. A pinch or two of pink Himalayan sea salt, natural salt. A squeeze or two of lime creates what Taylor Sabinton will refer to as a natural Gatorade. It's going to replenish your body where you need it, not just flush everything out so you're always urinating. Dieting is literally just as simple when you have the facts. Now, sure, I wear a whoop on this arm and I wear an aura on this finger. And oddly enough, two tracking devices that are incredibly scientific and specific that I don't ever take off give me two different caloretic loads every day. They're different by about 20% on most days. So even they, as you are deploying and depending on your fitness tracker to determine how much you eat, It is selling you short, my friend. It is not enough to base it off that. If you want to invest the 250 bucks or so in the base mathematics of your life to further optimize the performance of your body, I would question where else you are spending 250 bucks that you could pull away from it. Once you have the facts and you're forced to look them in the eye, you can make decisions going forward. It makes it way easier. And so all these diets, again, paleo or caveman or keto or vegan or anything, this framework works inside of all of it. Slight caloretic deficit, good hydration, good exercise, a good amount of protein that's not too hard on your body to process, having a little more fat than carbohydrates allows you a roadmap to start to make changes. Same thing if you happen to be a little more slender and you want to add some, add some weight to your body. It's very, very difficult for most of us to gain muscle mass without a slight accumulation of additional fat. Why is that? Because you need a caloretic surplus once again. You need to consume more calories than you eat every day. Then you need to burn every day. You consume more calories than you need to burn every day. And so it becomes very difficult depending on the load and the exercise level not only physically, but also mentally that you put your body through every day to determine exactly what you need calorie wise. And so you might overeat by two or 300 calories a day. And while that's certainly going to give your body the optimum amount of fuel it needs to perform and increase muscle mass, all the extra calories need to go somewhere and they get stored right for future times. And so we can work through some of the efficiencies of that throughout this week. But if you just start to master these basics, Right? Find a DEXA scan, find a place that does a VO2 max, cross-reference those numbers, come up with something very simple, talk to a dietitian. Everybody's going to have their own opinion. Right? That's the other thing. There is no perfect diet, there is no perfect plan, there is no perfect anything. 
We are going to get into tomorrow eating for your blood type and why I believe that to be impactful. We're going to get healing your gut and why that's impactful. We're going to get into all the damage you probably put your liver and kidneys through and why that's impactful. We're going to get into some really simple stuff that you might not have ever considered before. Because you start to put all these things together and the entire fitness industry as a whole, right? You join a challenge. You join, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join this 90-day challenge. I'm going to transform my body. I'm going to get all this stuff dialed in. I'm going to get all the variables. I'm going to give this all to you for free. I'm going to tell you exactly how to do it. More importantly, we're working internally to create calculators and systems. You can just email me and have it. Figure out your macronutrient load and how it works and how to calibrate what you need to eat is simple. It's science. And when you understand the science and you understand some of how your hormones are working and you understand sleep patterns and you understand stress load, then you understand heart rate variability. Now all of a sudden you create this picture where you're now finally in control of your body. Just like you're in control of your car sitting behind the steering wheel after you put the premium fuel in it. Today's the first step in starting to put premium fuel inside your body. I hope this is impactful. Do me a favor. If you have questions, shoot me an email. Ryan at lifeoptimizationgroup.com. It might take me a series of days to get back to you. All these resources, all the stuff that I know, you are more than welcome to it. I don't claim to be a health and wellness coach, but I will guarantee you I know so much about the human body, how it works, how the processes fire, that I'm just going to give it to you. You might not need to hire a health and wellness coach. You might not need to join a transformation. You might just be able to listen to the show for the next seven days. And I guarantee if you listen to the show for the next, I guess it would be six days now, by the end of the seventh total day, you will 100% have the tools needed to get shit done.